If you could change one thing about your favorite world setting, what would it be in the comments down below? Hello, my fellow GMs, DMs, creators, consternators, and innovators, and storytellers. I wish you a very good day. My name is Guy, and of course, this is how to be a great GM, but you knew that already because you're here. But just in case you haven't done it, hit that like button or the subscribe button even. Um, it, always, it always makes me smile. Now, we are talking about the final big step in terms of choosing the space in which you are going to play your game. We've looked at making your own world space. We've looked at using an existing world space. This last step is at taking an existing world space and making it your own by adjusting stuff, an alternative reality, if you will. And there are some very serious things that we have to look at, but there is also some really awesome stuff that we need to be cognizant of if we are to take full advantage of this ability of ours to manipulate existing material. But first, this week's sponsor is World Anvil. They've been with us for a long time, and we're very excited about one of their latest additions to the World Anvil toolset called Chronicles. Now, Chronicles is a dynamic timeline that allows you to create events, moments in history, in your world history, where you can link things to everything as usual. So here you can see they've created the actual Roman timeline of what happened during the founding of Rome and the creation of Rome. The pins that you create on your map are linked to the timeline. The events you log on your timeline can be linked to the map, as well as to all of the articles and things that you can imagine linking to each other in a very easy-to-use interface. Imagine managing all of your adventures and your notes that are around certain places on your maps in such a style. I think it's a really awesome function, and I can't wait to use it for my own games. Use the code GREATGM to get a discount today. Thank you, World Anvil. So when it comes to creating a world space out of an existing world space, so you decide you want to play in the uh, Beverly Hills 90210. Yes, I'm that old. I remember that series. I don't think I ever watched an episode of it, but the name just kind of stuck. Let's say you want to play in some kind of early 1990s sitcom, rom-com, young adult drama kind of environment. You want to play Baywatch or something along those lines. But you want to change it up. So instead of being set in Los Angeles or in Beverly Hills, uh, you, it's set in, I don't know, um, Utah or in Can Canada or in, you know, a little township in the middle of Rwanda. Your choice. How do you do that so that your players don't arrive at the table and go, cool, man, we're totally here to play some cool games. What? Yes, you're actually in the wrong place. You should actually be speaking Rwandan. That would cause some grief. We need to avoid that. We want them to sit down and go, I am so excited to play this game in Rwanda. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I mean, it could be, right? Rwanda is a beautiful country and it's got some amazing wildlife in there and the people are super friendly and very kind and nice to each other when they're not, you know, engaging in genocide. But they haven't done that for a long time. Now, what do we do? Well, the very first thing we have to do is we have to sit back and we have to say, what are the expectations? You know that word and you knew I was going to tell you that. We have to understand what the expectations are. Thank you, policeman outside. We have to understand what the expectations are in terms of this world space. Well, if we are going to be playing in Star Trek, and I know I use Star Trek a lot, but it's big enough, I think, that almost anyone knows pretty much it's about a bunch of people in a spaceship flying around in space. Um, what are the expectations? Well, it's being in a starship and flying around space. That's a pretty good expectation. If you're going to take that away, we need to be aware that you're taking away a major component of that world space. So you do still need to deep dive into the world space before you can start to change it. Know the rules before you break them. Also, they say repeatedly and annoyingly. That then is our next step. What are you going to change on the major scale? 
When we talk about changing, there's two scales, major scale and minor scale. On the major scale, changing things like, well, we're going to be playing in a Harry Potter world, but Hogwarts was destroyed about a hundred years ago, and the wizards now secretly get together in small covens, uh, educating those that they can whilst uh, on the run from a particularly... Um, Nazi-like uh, clergy uh, type of organization. Okay, that's a major change. On the other hand, if you go, well, actually, the head um, wizard of Hogwarts' name is not uh, Dumbledore. It's in actual fact, um, let's say, McEwen. That's a minor change. That's something that is not going to cause your players to fall off their chairs and go, it's so broken, I don't know what's going on. I don't think I've uh, actually had a player say that. I have, had a, I have had players get up and leave my table in frustration, but that was because they had issues uh, outside of the game and that, that, that was just them. So look at the major things that you want to change. Understand why you want to change them. Why do you want to destroy Hogwarts? Why do you want the USS Enterprise to be a warship and not to be a peaceful ship? Why do you want uh, Beverly Hills 90210 to be Rwanda 9155-4? Why do you want to change that? What is it that you're hoping for? The only answer that you should be giving is, I want to do this because I like the world space, I like some of the things about that world space, but I want to change it up and explore my own version of that world space. That's answer number one. And answer number two is, because my goal as the GM, remember your goal, my goal is to tell this kind of story and I can't do that if this is the situation. He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, my major change is that the technology that's in that world, they actually use ballistics and they use bullets. And yes, of course, the sort of power that He-Man wields is it can deflect bullets and all that kind of cool stuff. But if he gets shot in the back, he's as human as the rest of us. Or swords aren't used to deflect and to side hit, they're actually used to stab and thrust. I actually think that there was an uh, an episode of Robot Chicken uh, where Skeletor actually, or Beastman actually killed He-Man. It was an interesting exploration of what would have actually happened in that sort of situation. Those are major changes. You make them because they fit your goal or they fit your tone or because it is something that you think is going to be interesting to explore. You don't make them just because you don't like them. Your players might like them. Rather, if you want to change the location because you don't want to be playing in a Star Wars game with Empire and Rebels, change it to a planet that's far away from both and that hasn't really been affected by either of them, rather than just saying there is no Empire, it's just the Republic and, and that sort of thing. But we're playing in the time with Luke. The reason why is that when you take out a major component, when you when you look at this major, this major change, when you remove it, you have to run the what is going to happen? This is why you need to understand what the expectations were before you start taking stuff out. You have to understand what the concept was of that world space before you start taking stuff out. If you change a major thing, you then need to go, okay, so if I remove that component or if I change that component, what is the knock-on effect? What is the ripple effect going to be in my world space. And you have to follow that through as if you are creating your own world space, looking at things like the nations and the species and the religions and the transportation and communications. How are those things affected if you change the current status quo with a major change? Rebuild stuff using the existing world as your framework going, well, this is what they had, but that's because so-and-so was in power. If so-and-so is not in power, they wouldn't have had this, so they couldn't have done that. So it's a little bit of a restructuring. It's a very fun process. It's a, it's a major thing. Look at our own world. What if we ran our own world game and we're like, well, actually Hitler won. He defeated the Russians and he managed to take Russia somehow. Oh, how does that change everything? Well, there's a knock-on effect of significance there. There's a huge sudden power vacuum. Suddenly the Chinese are no longer just on their own. There's Anyway, we can go on and on and on for days. So let that thought experiment run for major changes. For minor changes, you don't have to worry. They are literally minor changes. But you do need to make note of these minor changes because otherwise you're going to confuse your players when you say that it's McEwen who's in charge of Hogwarts and they go, but what happened to Dumbledore? 
Dumbledore. No, that is actually Dumbledore, but I changed the name to McEwen. You don't want that. So you want to make notes, especially about the minor changes, but obviously about the major changes. Once you've done that, remember to always go back and test and reflect and say, well, do these changes allow me to explore the goal that I wanted to explore originally? Yes or no? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. We're all good here. Nothing to see here. We can move on. And then what you do is you take all of the notes that you have made about what you've changed, the ramifications that you've changed, the minor changes that you've changed, and you give that to your players so that they can have a look at it and then you play a session zero. Of any of these particular types of approaches to creating your world space, the one where you are adjusting an existing one is the one that requires you to do a session zero the most. Your players will be walking around the bridge of the Enterprise. No, it's the Mac Interface. Uh, okay, we're walking around the bridge of the Mac Interface. Do we see Captain Picard? It's Pilchard. Um, all right, we're walking around the bridge of the Mac Interface and we see Captain Pilchard. Why are we doing this exactly? Oh, because you wanted to play an Orville game, which and you took you took it from episode one of the Orville, which was much more comedic than any of the other series, because you realized you could actually make a fun serious sci-fi. Oh, okay, all right, fine. So let me guess, it's not Worf, it's Wolf. Hey, how did you know? Do you see how suddenly your players align once you have given them more information and once they understand why you've made those changes? They will only do that if you give them a primer and if you give them a session zero where they can explore this stuff and at the end of it you go, you know what, we don't want to go to Camelot, it is a silly place. See that reference for 50 experience points. So that, in a nutshell, is how I change an existing world space. Not to the point, you can change it as much as you like, but I make sure that my players are along with me on that journey because I will have the law masters going, actually, that's not the, uh, 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 my world. You don't want it to be so different that the players go, I thought we were playing a Buffy campaign. We haven't killed any vampires where, as a matter of fact, there's no magic here at all. We've been involved in political negotiations and legal battles. Well, yes, I wanted to do Buffy, but what if Buffy was Boston legal? What? How? If that had been a session zero, then everyone would have known you're going to be playing lawyers and attorneys and politicians and adjusted accordingly rather than being vampire slayers. It's little things like that that will set you apart from being a confusing GM to being a DM that people go, oh my goodness, I want to play in your game because you make them so much fun because you followed steps to make these worlds feel as if they're actually worlds that could exist rather than just these hodgepodge disasters that are meaningless to everybody. We don't want that. Massive thank you to you for watching all the way through to the end. Huge thank you to our Patreons and, of course, as always, to our sponsors. Until next week, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming!